Hello. In 2015, the UN adopted its 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. Among the 17 goals, SDG 5, which aims to end all forms of discrimination against women and to achieve gender equality. The EU has committed itself to implementing these goals, which have been integrated into the EU's policy and economic frameworks. Notwithstanding a long history of supporting, at least on paper, women's participation in the labour market at the supranational level, in an assessment based on Eurostat data from 2020, Commissioner for the Economy Paolo Gentiloni admitted that the EU has unfortunately moved away from its objectives on SDG 5. A recent report published by the Brussels office, the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, sheds light on the reasons for the lack of progress. Today, we're speaking to the authors of the report to find out more about the reasons for persisting gender inequalities in EU labour market participation and about policy levers to achieve real and lasting change. Dora, across the EU, gender inequalities in the labour market persist. According to your research for the report, in which areas are these most visible and in what ways are women affected? The major reason behind gender inequalities in the labour market is the burden of unpaid care work done inside the family. For example, more than a third of inactive women report their caring responsibilities as the main reason for not uh, working, not participating in the labour market, while that is the case for only a very small share of men, around 5%. The same goes for reasons for part-time employment. Uh, much more women than men work part-time uh, precisely because of their care responsibilities. So overall, the inequality on the labor market cannot be understood or then improved without taking into consideration the care responsibilities that take place outside the labor market itself. Your report offers an in-depth examination of gender and employment policies at the EU level. What is the most interesting and perhaps surprising finding? It was surprising that the amount of contradictions present in most of the EU goals, targets and strategies. That happens even on a declarative level. For, exa for example, the European social pillar is on one hand promoting the transition to open-ended contracts and prevention of all precarious forms of labor. But on the other hand, under the same chapter is promoting flexible and innovative forms of work, which as we know historically, historically were almost always precarious and opposed to uh, workers' interests. Regarding the gender labor market inequalities, the EU main concern is closing the employment gap with quality of employment not being the question of equal importance as was already mentioned. So high levels of in work at-risk poverty, high shares of women working part-time due to caring reasons, high pension gaps, all speak that the quality of employment should be the forefront of EU policies. Also, the minimum preconditions for closing or lowering gender gap in employment depend on high, higher uh, investments in affordable childcare, which at the moment, the current rate is not enough to reduce the weight of care work delegated to women. In 2016, the EU adopted its strategy to implement the UN 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. This aims, amongst other things, at guaranteeing gender equality and decent work with its SDGs 5 and 8. Katarina, has this step helped advance gender equality in the EU? First, we'd like to address three issues regarding the Sustainable Development Goals or SDGs. First, those Goals are set so wide that, are, that they almost lose their meaning. So the goal is ending all violence and discrimination against all women and girls by 2013. So that's an admirable goal, but it's not really easily achievable, especially when we take into account that it's not followed by any concrete plans. So that's the second problem. The SDGs have no policy measures attached to them. So even if there was a potential progress on SDGs, they, they, they will probably be a byproduct of some other de de developments in the specific countries or on the EU level. And the third, 
that the indicators that are available for measuring, measuring the progress on the SDGs are uh, not sufficient. Uh, so, for example, the indicator uh, measuring the physical and sexual violence, so the last data available is from 2012. So the designated indicator for measuring that part of the goal doesn't even uh, allow us to measure any of the progress. Uh, the indicators for decent work don't include share of temporary work or share of precarious work, and we could argue that those are important indicators of decent work. Also, uh, when measuring uh, decent work, the, these indicators don't take into account the gender inequalities and vice versa. So those are just some of the problems with measuring progress on SDGs. So when we look at the data, uh, especially on the indicators we focused on in the in our report from 2016, the gender employment gap stayed the same, but the share of inactive women due to caring res responsibility has has risen, and that's on the EU 27 level. We have to keep in mind that a lot of EU countries are far above those EU average. Right. So according to your analysis, has there been any progress as a result of integrating the SDGs into EU policy frameworks? From 2016 to 2020 is a really short period to give any definitive answers, but current developments are not giving us reason to be very hopeful, especially when we take into account consequences of the COVID-19 pandemic to the labour market. As you mentioned, the UN 2030 goals serve as non-binding guidelines for political action. What legally binding guidelines or policy steps would have to be adopted at EU policy level in order to achieve real and lasting change towards gender equality? To name a few, since the burden of care work is the most uh, important factor limiting women's opportunities uh, in the labour market, uh, some of the binding uh, measures should deal with better leave policies and with the childcare system. So one uh, example of a binding measure would be that the Euro European Union should standardize leave policies in line with existing research and good, good practices in some member, st member states, uh, namely the Scandinavian countries, which have the best uh, leave policies. Uh, so the European Union should determine minimal leave uh, benefits at the level of 80 to 100 uh, percent of previous pay, uh, and also in order to encourage fathers to take uh, or other parents to take parental leaves, uh, the leaves should be non-transferable and well paid, because otherwise uh, men who, uh, in the average, have uh, higher wages would not have the incentive to uh, take on the leaves. Um, another example is a binding measure regarding childcare. So the European Union should address the questions of availability, duration and affordability of childcare in its targets and policies. Uh, and in order for the member states to increase childcare capacities and secure legal entitlements to uh, early childhood education and care for all children, sufficient investments uh, in these sectors must be made, possibly financed on the EU level. Um, then also some measures should deal with the quality of women's jobs. So when advocating for the work family reconciliation policies, part-time employment as an option for women should be approached with caution. Uh, these policies should stress the importance of union protection and making working conditions similar to those of full-time jobs, uh, because otherwise women are being trapped in low quality jobs. Uh, also, part-time employment should be used only as a temporary solution, which should lead back or to uh, full-time employment. Another example of a binding measure has to do with the current proposal of the new European Directive on Minimum Wages. So unions, trade unions at the national and EU levels should advocate not only for pay transparency, as is currently the case, but also for raising the level of wages in low paid sectors and in so-called essential occupations, where women often make the majority of employees. Thank you. To find out more and to access the full report, including four country case studies, 
please visit our website at rosalux.eu. Thanks for watching.